This program is brought to you by Emory University. Thank you very much for this uh, nice introduction. And thank you also for organizing this lecture and event here at Emory uh, University. I'm really happy to be here at, the, at your law school. Uh, I met uh, Martha Feynman in Norway um, a couple of years ago, uh, twice at different workshops or seminars, and it was really a pleasure to, to discuss with uh, Martha her vulnerability theory. Um, and I've been trying to work on that um, since, particularly lately, and, and we had a discussion around that earlier today. I'll, I'll um, try to integrate some thinking about vulnerability in what I do tonight, but it's not particularly on the vulnerability. It's more on the committee's work in general, but we might touch upon it in the discussion possibly also. Um, and it's really nice also to be here um, as part of the celebrations of the 25th anniversary of, of the UN Convention. And uh, listening to uh, your dean, it was really interesting to hear how you have uh, stressed or placed a particular emphasis on children and the needs of, of children at this law school. Um, so I, I'll speak first a bit about the convention, not a lot about the convention. I guess many of you know it, at least partly, uh, so, or maybe it's different. I guess many know, or many know, many do not know so much about it, but anyway. Uh, why do we need a separate convention on children's rights, you may ask? Because uh, children have rights under all other human rights conventions as well. I mean, they, they apply to all persons. They don't say that children are accepted in any way. But children have tended to be invisible under human rights, other human rights conventions, like the one, uh, the UN Convention on Civil and Political Rights and the UN Convention on the Economic and Social and Cultural Rights. So people have tended to forget that children have rights. So that was kind of one of the main points of, of making a separate convention was to show legally that children have rights, that the rights, the human rights apply to children as well as to adults. So you could say that that is a legal purpose of clarifying this. Then you could also say it has a symbolic purpose to show the world that children are rights holders and to show children themselves that they are rights holders. And this links in with the pedagogical purpose of reminding adults that children have these rights, that children are subjects of rights. Um, and, of course, when you make a separate convention uh, on the rights of the child, you adapt the rights to children so that the way these rights are formulated in this convention is, to a certain extent, the same as in other human rights conventions, but to a certain extent also different and adapted to children's needs and the situation of children. And some rights are specific to children. They are not the least important due to their vulnerability, you might say, because they have other needs than adults. Their needs vary throughout childhood, but persons under 18 are seen to have certain needs, a certain kind of situation of vulnerability in common. And so that is also a, a reason to make a separate convention, to have particular rights that apply to children like the best interests principle, which is not only a principle, it is a right of the child to have best interests taken into consideration when decisions are made. The child has the right to be heard under Article 12 of the Convention, that is also a particular right for children. And children have also in the Convention quite a lot of protection rights, which are specific to children. I don't go a lot into the contents of the convention itself, because that is not the main topic of this speech, but it's just to, to um, give an overview before sort of going into the, um, the, the topic of this speech more specifically. You can also mention the right to rehabilitation, the right to play, the right to care, which are different from the rights of adults. The common way of, of uh, grouping the rights in the uh, Convention on the Rights of the Child, I guess some of you know at least, is the three Ps, as they are commonly called, participation, provision, and protection. Um, and the, the reason why this 
categorizing of the rights is used is I think it's, it's practical because then you, you remember that the convention covers all these aspects. Participation, the child should participate in, in decisions regarding the child or affecting the child in any way. And children should participate in decisions affecting children more on the policy level, whether be it uh, a group of children or, or children more in general. They also have the freedom of expression more, more widely, not only in matters affecting them, but in everything that has to do with society, democracy. This is more the democratic part of the participation uh, provisions. And they have the freedom of assembly also under the convention. Then the provision rights would be the right to, have, to be provided for with different kinds of services and with money for that matter. It's the right to health, the right to education, the right to a standard of living. So it would be the economic and social rights. Then, as I mentioned, children have rights to protection. They have a right against all forms, uh, to protection against all forms of violence. They have a right to um, protection against abuse and neglect and against different forms of exploitation. It might be exploitation as laborers or as uh, sexual workers, sexual exploitation and exploitation in drug trafficking and so on. So these mostly cover all the rights of the convention, except maybe the best interest principle, because it goes into all of this. And also the non-discrimination rules that it covers all. Um, the right to, to life and, and uh, development would be both a right to be protected and the right to be provided for, and also the right to participation. So you can see that some of the rights are more general and, and they sort of cut across these. And I think um, thinking about vulnerability, um, the vulnerability of children, maybe what strikes first is, or what you think about first is the right to protection because children are vulnerable, they need protection. But of course, the, the provision rules are extremely important as well to, to deal with children's vulnerability because you can't be, um, you can't be protected and, and you cannot have, have um, a proper life and development as a child if you don't have your right to health uh, implemented or your right to education. And also to, to um, in a way, counter your vulnerability, you might say you need the right to participation to, to um, even if you're vulnerable, to be able to ex exercise some kind of autonomy. So just to sum up, the significance of the Convention on the Rights of the Child is that it views the child as a rights holder. That was a kind of new way of thinking in 1989 when the Convention was made. We had some previous um, declarations on the rights of the child. It was one from 1924, quite general, but still important five principles, I think. Then we had the Declaration on the Rights of the Child in, in um, 1959, I think. Um, and that was, it, it's called the Rights of the Child, but still it was not binding on the states. It was not formulated as rights in the way that the Convention is. And um, especially the participation rights are a new way of thinking about children, that they are not only to be protected, not only to be provided for, but they actually should have the right to participate in decisions regarding themselves. Also, it is unique, this convention, in that it covers all types of human rights, as I mentioned, civil and political rights, socioeconomic rights, etc., plus the protection rights. And it is special in that it's ratified, by almost all states in the world, except, as you know, the United States, and in addition, Somalia and South Sudan. Somalia is a rather disorganized state, and South Sudan is a new state. So I won't say anything more about the US. 
<laughs> but it would be very interesting to, to have the, the convention ratified by the US, really. And the US has ratified its two optional protocols. So it's not that um, the US doesn't want to be bound by, by international rules in this respect, but I, as far as I understand, there are many different reasons why it's not being ratified. But anyway, these 194 ratifications, which is really a lot more than any other convention, um, makes the CRC a strong instrument, not only politically and morally, I would say, but also a strong legal instrument to really use to, to get the rights that children have the right to, <laughs> are entitled to. Then about the working methods of uh, the committee. We are a, com a committee consisting of 18 members. We are so-called independent experts. Um, actually, we are supported by our states in the first place. They nominate us. The, we have to be nominated by a state in order to run for uh, an election as a member. But then we are elected by the General Assembly of the United Nations. And once we have been elected, we are so-called independent experts. So we should not be too close to our own state or to any other state. We should be able to act in an independent manner. The members at present are from countries all around the world. From Africa, we have Ethiopia, Tunisia, Egypt. Then from Asia, we have Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, Sri Lanka, and Malaysia. Often, um, Tunisia and Egypt are seen together with Saudi Arabia and Bahrain to form the MENA region, Middle East and North Africa region, so that depends a bit. But the, the UN uh, formal division is as this. Uh, Ecuador and uh, Brazil from Latin America, and then we have quite a few European countries. And um, you might say this is not such a good thing, because we would like to have more representation from all over the world, but this is the, the um, uh, members or the possible members are nominated by their states, as I said, and it's up to the state whether they vote for them or not. And last time we had a lot of candidates from Africa and only one of them was elected. And possibly that was because there were too many candidates, so the votes were too spread out in a way. But at least, or anyway, from, from Europe, we have Spain, Monaco, Italy, Austria, Hungary, uh, Slovakia, Russia, and Norway. So it's, uh, it's a big um, group, but quite a few of them are from, from East uh, Europe, at least, Hungary, Slovakia, and Russia. Um, the reporting process, uh, the convention says that the uh, country or the state should report every five years. So in principle, we get reports from all countries every five years. Uh, in addition, we get separate reports for the two optional protocols, the first time states report after they're ratified. The two first optional protocols are on uh, the sale of children, child exploitation, and uh, uh, no, I mean, <laughs> child uh, prostitution and child pornography. That is the one. And the other is on children in armed conflict. And uh, 167 has ratified one of them, and 157 states have ratified the others. I don't uh, quite now remember which is which. Doesn't really matter. But it means we have got a lot of reports from, from states under those two optional protocols as well, including the United States, the first time they report. Then we get supplementary reports from national human rights institutions of that country. Uh, we get reports from UNICEF in the countries where they are active. We get a lot of reports from NGOs. They may be international NGOs like Plan International and Save the Children, but they are also often national NGOs. Um, dealing with different issues within children's rights. They may also, also be more specifically on children with disabilities or the global initiative to end all forms of corporal punishment and so on. We get a lot of um, NGO reports which are really useful for the committee in its work. We need to get some information, some alternative information through other sources in order to be able to ask the states the right questions and not just accept Everything, well, we could accept what is in the report, but what is not written in the, in the report is often uh, just as interesting as what is in the report. Um, and the way it is formulated may be a bit more shiny than, than the reality, and then it's, it's good to get 
other, uh, have other sources of information to, to hear what's actually going on in the country. So then, after having had all of this written material, we have a pre-session with uh, these institutions or organizations, the, the NGOs and the uh, National Human Rights Institutions, UNICEF uh, and so on. They come for half a day and, and um, update us on their material and can clarify and give us additional information. Then we write a list of issues, a list of questions to the state that they have to answer before they come for the dialogue. So we get some written replies from the state. Then we have a dialogue with the state in Geneva. If it's the, the convention alone and not the optional protocols, we have that dialogue for a day. So it's three plus three hours. And that is not a lot of time to discuss all the different issues that we would like to discuss with the states. And also the, the reports of the countries are going to be shortened uh, from next year. And that will also be a challenge for the states to provide us with all the information they would like to give within a much shorter space. Um, I must admit, I don't remember quite now what, if it's 40 pages or whatever. Um, so this dialogue is, is really sort of the main um, thing within this whole review process. That is where things happen, is in the dialogue where we can discuss with the states. What comes out of it at the end is the concluding observations from the committee, where we give our concerns on, on the different rights of the child or the situation of children in different areas, for instance in education, in health, with regard to family life, with regard to the right to be heard, with regard to children in conflict with the law. I mean, this, this convention, as you know, it covers such a lot of different issues. And um, we try to deal with as much as we can in these concluding observations. They have also become often rather long, and we have been told by, by the states there's been a treaty body strengthening process that I guess some of you know, uh, which has um, had a, a good outcome last March or April in the, in the um, General Assembly of the UN giving us some extra time every year to deal with uh, reports. So we are going to split into two chambers, part of next year, so that we could deal with twice as many um, countries, because we have a huge backlog because of all these extra reports we have got um, under the two optional protocols. Um, anyway, this is one thing, we got some extra time, but they also said we want your concluding observations to be shorter. So we have to make them shorter and, and then more focused. At the same time, they are supposed to be concrete enough for the countries to act upon. And that is a challenge, to make them short at the same time as they should be uh, focused and concrete. I should mention also the individual complaints mechanism. Um, it was there's an optional protocol which is called the third optional protocol on the communications procedure. It was adopted by the UN General Assembly in December 2011, so it's almost three years ago. Um, in January, 14 states had ratified this um, optional protocol and 10 states were enough to, to have it enter into force. So it entered into force three months later in April of this year. Um, we have not had any complaints yet because, as I say, uh, almost at, um, no, it's, it's um, point number four. The violation must have occurred after that state ratified, states ratified the optional protocol. So that's why we don't have any complaints yet because 14 states have ratified and the violation, the fact that the child complains about has to have happened after the ratification of that state. And in addition, they have to um, exhaust all available domestic remedies. So for most states, that means that they have to go through the court system before they can come to the committee, which takes a long time normally. It shouldn't, but still. And then there's a time limit of one year uh, to, to uh, complain to Geneva, to the committee, um, after they have exhausted the domestic remedies. Um, I, I think I skipped one point. It's uh, the complaint must be handed in by either an individual child or a group of children or on behalf of these. So they must be individualized. Um, there was a proposal um, when this was drafted, this optional protocol, that it should also be possible to um, make a kind of class action to the committee without having identified individual children because then it would be possible to, to focus on uh, a problematic issue in a state without having to, to make specific children complain. And unfortunately, that was not 
uh, the states did not want that. Um, Either the child can, um, complains him or herself, or he gives his, com his consent, she or he gives his complaint, uh, consent, or an adult must justify acting on their behalf without a consent. The, the committee has the, the obligation to um, ensure that the child's best interests is taken into account in this whole process. And at the end of, of uh, dealing with the complaint, the committee will give views, which is the same as the other UN uh, bodies do that receive complaints. We do not give binding decisions. We also issue general comments. Uh, that's on special subjects where the committee sees the need to issue guidance to states on the interpretation, either because it's uh, an, an issue on the rise um, for instance, we, we issued a um, general comment on children's rights and, and the business sector one and a half year ago, and that's because we saw that this was something that we needed to do because there was not much awareness about children's rights and the business sector. And also we've done it on best interests because there was a lot of confusion as to the contents of that uh, concept. Um, the general comments are more legally refined than the concluding observations. And of course, they are general in nature and not specific. And we've, ma we've made 18 general comments in all. Then I'm going to come to the dilemmas. I thought it was, would be interesting not to just sort of describe what we're doing, but also to problematize a bit um, certain issues. I've, I've thought of what are really the dilemmas that we deal with. I guess we deal with a lot of dilemmas, but I've picked, up, picked out a few of them. Um, one of them is procedural, the other ones are more to the contents of what we're doing, but the committee does not have a follow-up procedure. And um, that means that we make our recommendations to the state, but we do not have anything to do, formally at least, with the state again until the next dialogue. So the state has to do as best it can, or will, <laughs> with our concluding observations, and then we, it comes back with a report, and, and many states don't come back after five years as they are supposed to, they come back after six or seven years, ten years. So it may really be a long time until the committee has seized the state again, to put it that way. So it would really be good if we, we were able to request a report uh, in the meantime, for instance, after two years to, to make the state aware that they actually have to follow up on these obligations and to hear what they've been doing. And, or, or visit the state. It might be the rapporteurs. We are usually two members that prepare each dialogue or the dialogue with each, with each state. And then those two members or one of them might go to that country to, to discuss with the government how they could actually follow up. But we do not have the resources. We do not have the money to do this. What we get is the, the travel to Geneva and the stay in Geneva. We don't have anything else outside of that. Um, and we don't have the time, really, either, because uh, since we have the backlog to deal with, we have to be a bit careful about how we spend the time. Sometimes uh, rapporteurs are invited to the country afterwards. For instance, the rapporteur for Australia was invited to Australia after the dialogue or after the concluding observations, a few months after, to discuss with them how they could do this, because they could see that there were some interesting recommendations, but they didn't quite know in what way to go about them. So she was invited, and I think that's interesting, but it's really at random. So what we have to do is to rely on civil society, on NGOs, on the National Human Rights Institution, on, on the public, everybody, children themselves, to, to uh, push the government on doing what we've told them to do. And um, actually the week before I came here, no, yeah, yeah, I guess it was last Monday, actually. There, there was a report presented by Save the Children Norway. Um, so it was about the, the situation in Norway, what had been done to follow up all the concluding observations to the, I think we've been rep we've reported five times. So they really went um, uh, topic by topic. And uh, they had had a student to do this, actually, but she's a good student, so it was a good report. and, and uh, uh, very, I think, objective and, and not making things worse than they were, but still pointing to something that might have been done better. So this, uh, and that was Save the Children. So that was, I mean, the, the government does things itself, but it does not always make this kind of big overview, which is really useful, I think.
for the government itself also. Then to um, um, kind of dilemma that we, we got into when we were making a general comment, our last general comment together with um, the CEDAW committee, the committee uh, on the elimination of discrimination against women. And it's, it's quite, it's the first time that um, two committees have made a general comment together. And it was quite a challenge because we have, I mean, even if we have girl children in common, we also both cover areas that the other committee or convention does not cover. So we have, it took a long time, I must admit, to make this general comment. And also we don't meet in Geneva at the same time most often, so that was also a challenge. But anyway, um, what was the main point of discussion between the two committees uh, in the final big, there's been a lot of discussions along the way, but I've <laughs> chosen one of them, which was really a, a discussion we had at the end. It was about child marriage. And marriage below 18 is considered to be child marriage. And in our committee, all the time, we say to states, you should not have a lower age of marriage than 18. And then it turned out that the CEDAW committee wanted to, to let children marry after 16 if they really wanted to themselves because they are very um, interested in, in promoting the autonomy of, uh, of women and, and also children. So they thought it would be wrong to, to prohibit children uh, totally from marrying under the age of 18. And so we had to, to come to a, a compromise and the compromise is what you can see here. Uh, in exceptional, well, I, I should start with uh, the beginning of this sentence. As a matter of respecting the child's evolving capacities, which is in the Convention on the Rights of the Child as well, in Article 5, and autonomy, that is more the CEDAW con Convention, in making decisions that affect her or his life, and then is what is up there. In exceptional circumstances, a marriage of a mature, capable child below the age of 18 may be allowed, provided that the child is at least 16 years old and that such decisions are made by a judge based on legitimate exceptional grounds defined by law and on the evidence of maturity without deference to cultures and traditions. So we wanted to, I think maybe to a greater extent, take especially girls, I must say, vulnerability into account all the way up to 18 and protect them from the possibility of somebody else wanting them to marry and, and taking the case to, to this judge and the judge saying, well, this is okay if your parents want it, um, and then they speak to the girl and she, if they do at all, uh, speak to the girl, but she may feel obliged to say, yes, I want to marry. Uh, so we wanted to protect the girl from this altogether. But on the other hand, we, we needed to make a compromise and um, um, that is why we have this, all these procedural things and also the criteria, the requirements that have to be fulfilled. So it, it has to be by a judge and, and uh, the criteria have to be defined by law and they have to be legitimate, exceptional grounds. Um, the child has to be um, a mature, capable child and, and there has to be evidence of maturity without culture and traditional uh, influence. So I, I think this is quite an interesting um, example of how you can see vulnerability up against autonomy in a way in this case. So, but what we have seen from, from many countries is that they have this um, exception and it's not the exception, it's the rule. And that is the problem with uh, all exceptions, I think, um, that they, at least many of them become rules instead of just exceptions. Then about circumcision of boys. Which, has, which is an upcoming topic um, as a violation of the Convention of the Rights of the Child. At least there are strong forces that say 
that it is a, a violation of this convention. It's a, a growing movement, I would say, to end circumcision of boys. There's an organization in the UK which is very active on this. The Scandinavian ombudspersons, um, maybe particular the, particularly the Norwegian one, who is a, a pediatrician, um, she really wants to stop this practice of circumcising boys when they are newborn or, or small children. Um, so you might ask in the first place, is this a violation of, of the child's physical integrity? Is it violence to the child? You, you cut uh, the child, it hurts there and then. Uh, it may not have harmful consequences. In, in a few cases it really has harmful consequences. We had a boy of two who died because uh, this was not done properly at the, um, at the doctors. Um, anyway, these are things that we are discussing at the moment inside the committee also. Is this to be seen as a violation of the physical integrity? Is it violence? And even if it is a kind of small violence, um, if you would consider it small, uh, there's the question or the issue of freedom of religion. And then, is it the freedom of religion of whom? Is it the, the religious society? Is it the parents? Or is it the child? And if it is a question of the child's freedom of religion, maybe then one might wait until the child has the autonomy to decide for him or herself that he or she would be old enough to do it. Um, and that is the point of view of the Norwegian ombudsperson, is to, to, um, to see this as a question of autonomy. And you should not do, make such a violation of the physical integrity until the child is old enough to consent him or herself. We had this discussion in the committee in 2013 when Israel was before us. And uh, we had a, a, quite an interesting discussion and ended up with saying this. The committee expresses concern about repeat, reported short and long-term complications arising from some traditional male circumcision practices. So we refrain from, from talking about circumcision in general and instead mention these some traditional male circumcision practices, which are, they, they drink the blood of, of uh, the baby, and uh, they may also not be very hygienic, as far as I have understood, because they can have some complications. Um, and recommended that the, that the state party undertake a study on the short and long-term complications of ma male circumcision. So we didn't uh, recommend them or advise them to stop it completely, but to undertake a study so that they could sort of start maybe preparing the ground for at the later stage prohibiting this kind of circumcision. Then to abortion. We had the Holy See before us in, in uh, January, February. And um, the Holy See has ratified the convention uh, not only on behalf of the Vatican State and its 36 children, but on behalf of the Catholic Church all around the world. And um, they have ratified and at the same time they say that we cannot do a lot of things because this is under the jurisdiction of the countries themselves. So it's a kind of tension um, it built into this ratification. Uh, but on the other hand, they say that what we can do is to encourage the implementation of the convention all around the world in the Catholic countries. So that's what we held them to, that they should encourage uh, whenever they had the possibility to. I'll only mention here, we, we had a lot of discussion on sexual abuse with, uh, with the Holy See. But what I'll mention here is the issue of abortion because um, well, I can, I can read the, the um, concern. The committee expresses its deepest concern that in the case of a nine-year-old girl in Brazil who underwent an emergency life-saving abortion in 2009 after she had been raped by her stepfather, and, uh, an archbi uh, it's not the stepfather who is uh, <laughs> the Archbishop of Pernambuco, but this Archbishop uh, in Brazil sanctioned the mother of the, of the girl as well as the doctor who performed the abortion. The sanction was, they, they um, excommunicated them, I think. The sanction was later approved by the head of the congregation for bishops of the Roman Catholic Church. And we recommended the Holy See, we urged the Holy See, which, which is a word we use when we want to make it stronger, to review its position on abortion, which places obvious risks on the life and health of pregnant girls, and to amend Canon 1398 relating to abortion with a view to identifying circumstances under which ac access to abortion services may be permitted. So review its position, it's quite strong to say that to the Catholic Church, um, 
but especially when it's obvious risks on the life and health of pregnant girls. And she was so young that this was an, a risk just because she couldn't give birth without it being a risk, uh, and also the pregnancy itself. And um, their answer to that, and also we asked them to, to amend the, the, the religious law on this, their answer to this was um, that, oh yes, we should have excommunicated the father as well. Um, that was in the dialogue. Um, well, you could say that there is no right to abortion as such under the convention. Um, and then when abortion is prohibited and even criminalized in, in many countries, can the, the committee intervene into this? You have the freedom of religious societies to decide on their own internal rules, but you have on the other side, on the other hand, the right to health and protection of the pregnant girl. And, and we are really not in doubt that this has to come before the freedom of religious societies to make their own rules. Um, so then where to sort of draw the line is a different issue, but when the health and, and uh, even life of the child is in danger, you need to, to have provisions to make abortion possible. Then to the rights of the family, as against the rights of the child, because there is a global movement which is really growing at the moment in favor of the family. And I, I heard Martha told me that there's been a, a proposal by, by um, well, religious societies, I guess, in, in the US to have parental rights uh, included into the constitution. And I guess that is part of the same movement. And. Um, it, it may look innocent, this family movement. They organized a um, human rights council panel in, in September and, and it was um, uh, prepared in June and the resolution really looked very nice and, and uh, acceptable to all. So I think 95 states or something um, supported this resolution of this panel. Um, but what it turns out to be is that it does not recognize different types of family, like single parent families even, but also same sex families are not recognized by, by this global movement. Um, and also the rights of individual family members within the family uh, to freedom from violence, etc., are not uh, recognized. It's, it would be the women's rights and children's rights. And this makes, of course, children and women very vulnerable if, if you strengthen the right of the family, it would really often mean, maybe usually mean, the right of the father to exercise his authority. Um, it was interesting to hear, uh, I was present at this Human Rights Council panel in Geneva in, um, in September, and, and uh, there were some really strong statements by states um, promoting for instance, same-sex families, or at least supporting same-sex families, and saying clearly that they support this, this kind of family, they, they uh, do not want to discriminate against them, and uh, they are really against this um, rights of the family. There are many European states, but also quite a few other states from Latin America and so on. Chile was very strong, for instance. Um, so really, this different types of family and also the right of the child to be free from all kinds of violence within the family was all strongly um, spelt out to the Human Rights Council in that uh, panel. So I, I think in that panel, um, the, the family movement didn't manage to come out very strong. It seems to consist of, of uh, countries, I mean governments from Eastern Europe, uh, Russia, Hungary, and so on, and uh, aligning with states of Africa, governments in certain states in Africa, and also then with the religious movement in, in the United States, and also, I think, uh, Islamic states. So there's a kind of oh, strange link between all of these, uh, but they have the same, seem to have the same goal. Um, in some countries, we actually see a backlash regarding children in conflict with the law uh, related to this family movement, which is a bit strange, I think, because children in conflict with the law doesn't have very much to do, I mean, at least not when they become in conflict with the law, to do with the rights of the family. But it seems that any kind of strengthening of the rights of children and adolescents are seen as a threat to the family. 
And uh, in some countries, this is the, the area, the conflict with the law, where they have seen it most clearly, I think. Then to child labor, I think I only have a couple left. Yes, if you are worried about the time. <laughs> Um, yeah, I mentioned child labor because we had a very interesting discussion when we were at the Congress in Mexico last week. Uh, it was a global Congress. It was mainly, it mainly consisted of, of uh, people from Latin America, from governments and, and mainly, I think, from, from uh, well, quite a few from governments, but also a lot from NGOs in Latin America, but also some, some uh, uh, people from other parts of the world. We were about 800 or more than that people. And the Committee on the Rights of the Child organized discussions with young people on certain issues. And um, we did not really put child labor on the agenda, but it came up as an issue that the, the adolescents wanted to discuss. And um, the minimum age of labor should be 15. That is what the, the committee says because the ILO has said that in its uh, convention on, um, well, it's called the Minimum Age Convention, which is from 1973. It's number 138, which we refer to a lot in the committee. Um, it has 13 for light work, but uh, anyway, it's 15, which is the main age. And the committee also says that the minimum age for, of labor should not be lower than uh, the finishing age of compulsory school. So if you finish school at 16, you should not be allowed to start working at 15 because that would interfere with your schooling. Um, then these children, uh, and it turned out quite a few of these adolescents that were present, some of them even maybe younger than 13, um, talked about their right to work because they said well, our families are poor. We want to work, we want to support our families, and without our support, we won't have enough to eat. We won't have the possibility to pay for school books. And we said to them <laughs> that child labor keeps up the cycle of poverty. Um, it interferes with education. It takes jobs from, from the parents of the children, because ch children are then chosen to, to work instead of parents because they are cheaper. Um, and children are exploited uh, in the labor market. I mean, all of these things we know. But on the other hand, this became really a, a, a vivid discussion because these children were really um, emphasizing their wish and their right to work to provide for the family. And um, what they said was, we, we don't want to be exploited. We want the work to be regulated so that we can work for certain hours. We can work in a kind of work which is not detrimental, um, not hazardous in any way, and, and also, I guess, not only not hazardous, but, but uh, not uh, harmful to them in any way. And um, I think we're going to keep to, to uh, saying that uh, states should not let children work until the age of 15, 16, when they end compulsory school. But I really can see that there is a dilemma in this uh, discussion because we want to have children participate, we want to listen to children's views, but once they, they have views that are so different from ours, we don't listen to them anymore. Well, we listen, but we have uh, other views than they have, and we think that we know better than them what is the right solution. So that is the one dilemma. The other dilemma is that they are actually in a very difficult uh, situation. I mean, they, have, they live in poor families and, and uh, they see that they can help their families and if they're not allowed to help, they, they, um, they will have problems, all of them. Um, and, and the children, but because the children that were present there, they were, I guess, re resourceful children, even if they didn't have a lot of money, they had managed to cope with school beside working. And um, what about all the children out there that are not at, as good as them to, to sort of do both at the same time? Then to my final dilemma, it's about designating vulnerable groups of children. And I had a discussion at lunchtime with some of you who are present here about this issue because uh, it's, I've been preoccupied with this while writing an article on the CRC and the vulnerability of children because reading Martha Feynman's uh, excellent work, I, I see that we should not be designating vulnerable groups of children because 
Uh, it might be stigmatizing. Uh, but the convention itself has specific provisions for children with disabilities, children of ethnic, religious, and linguistic minorities, for refugee and asylum-seeking children. I think they are the main ones that are specifically mentioned in the, in the convention. And also the committee points to, to these groups in our concluding observations, but we, not only those, but a lot of other groups, children in street situations, girls, um, yeah, all, all sorts of children in institutions and so on. And we find it, it's necessary to do this in order to recommend target, targeted measures to, to this, these groups. I mean, to make the... the states aware that they have certain problems and what those problems are and, and what the state could do to deal with those problems. Um, however, I can understand that it may be stigmatizing and be the basis and justification for discriminatory um, treatment. For instance, we said to Kuwait this year about Bidun children, which is a kind of stateless children. Um, we said the committee is, however, however, concerned that due to the marginalized situation of their families, Bidun children drop out of school and work on the streets and or as domestic workers. And we, address, we, we urged the, part, uh, the state party to address the root causes of poverty and of the economic exploitation of Bidun children and ensure that families living in poverty receive financial support and free and accessible services and that their children do not drop out of school. So, in a way, I, th I think it is true that when we describe them in this way, it's not very nice. I mean, it, it is in a way negative. We say they drop out of school, they are exploited, um, or they, they, uh, they uh, work on the streets. On the other hand, what Martha answered to me during lunch was that we, we need to look at the institutions and, and what makes them, what puts them in this situation and what can be done about the institutions to, to uh, improve the situation. And, and I guess the way we, what we recommend the, the uh, states to do is kind of trying to, to uh, or we, we think that they should make those institutions to address the root causes of poverty and ensure that families living in poverty receive financial support. So in a way, I guess what we, rec what we recommend is okay and in line with the vulnerability theory, but maybe we need not point to them in this stigmatizing way, I'm not sure. Um, so that was what I, I had meant to say, I think, in the first place. Uh, you are, uh, so thank you for listening for such a long time. It was longer than I had uh, meant, actually. <laughs> Um, but you may now ask uh, questions, and then you are kindly asked to use the microphones. So you'll have to come down, oops, almost to the podium. And I should stay up here, I guess, because then I have a microphone to try to answer. <laughs> Who is first? <laughs> Hi, I'm Casey Cooper. I'm a graduate of Emory Law School, and I really liked your presentation. Thank you for coming. Um, I kind of, this is kind of a question kind of asking you to talk a little bit more about it, um, but I had some questions about um, how to bring a case forward to the committee with the third optional protocol, because um, you said they tried to get a mechanism for a class action, but that kind of fell through, so I'd like to know kind of why that fell through. Um, and then you pointed out that there has to be a year waiting period after all um, remedies have been exhausted. So I kind of want to know why that one year extra. Um, and then with exhausting all remedies, you have children here. And so you're hoping, one, that their parents are going to bring it forward because children don't necessarily know about the convention, about their rights. Um, they don't know how to bring a case forward. Um, I know that there are some NGOs and organizations aimed at finding these children, but I kind of want to know what are your hopes for these cases actually coming forward logistically? Um, oh, what was your first question? I uh, <laughs> about, um, with the class action. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, the class action. Yes, um, that was because the states thought it would be too far reaching. They were afraid of, of too many. I think uh, complaints may be being brought exactly by, by NGOs um, on behalf of groups of children. So 
that's I, I can't I can't really answer anything else than that because it's just they didn't want it and and I know that Yang He Lee was who was the previous chair of the committee and who was really uh, eager to have this complaints mechanism uh, adopted she was very sorry that this uh, um, possibility of class action was not uh, adopted um, and and I think that would have been a good chance to to um, have the real issues regarding many children put before the committee instead of maybe resourceful children from from Europe uh, or at least from rich, rich countries using this uh, possibility to complain um, so I, I, I think it's a pity myself as well. As for the, the one-year time limit, then I have expressed myself unclearly because uh, I, I know it was up there as a one-year time limit. It's the other way. They have to do it within one year. Yeah, uh, because they, the state should, I, I don't know it's, if it's about the state, I guess it's about the state's interest. They don't want to have complaints coming long after things have happened. And it's also, it's, it's more difficult to have things um, uh, verified and about the facts the longer time that goes so that's why and your last question was how will they be able to um yeah yeah um the, the, we've got actually one complaint. I said we didn't have any, but there was one complaint that had to be dismissed. Uh, it was from a state that had ratified, but the, the, everything had happened before the state had ratified. But that was, uh, just as an example, that was a, um, a boy, a man, young man, who was um, around 18, and it was about age assessment in, uh, in um, immigration case. And, and um, it was put forward by a, a lawyer. So in that case, it was he was old enough sort of to act on his own. And I, you know, in the immigration system, we often have lawyers uh, representing the young people. So there may be, I, and I think my country, Norway, is is rather afraid that we will have a lot of complaints if they ratify in the area of immigration because the lawyers are very active and and children's rights have been uh, to the forefront of the discussion a lot in, in that area. So that is one possibility. But the other possibility, and I think you're right, there will be NGOs that have to be active in order to help children to bring uh, uh, complaints forward because uh, parents normally would not know and um, would not know about the possibility. And sometimes the parents wouldn't be interested in a child complaining. So we would also need to have inside the country. I think you asked about the exhaustion of domestic remedies as well. And um, it would mean that children need to go to the courts because very few states would accept as exhaustion of, of domestic remedies that they only go to an ombudsperson, for instance. Um, so that is also a kind of tricky thing for a child. And you need then to have child-friendly courts. You need to have uh, legal aid. Um, yeah, and you need to have representation for the child, which might not be the parents necessarily if they don't want to support the child. So it's quite a long way to Geneva, to put it that way, I think. Hmm. Hi, I'm a graduate student at the Rollins School of Public Health, so naturally my question is health-related. Um, you mentioned circumcision, and I was wondering, um, you didn't really discuss the fact that like, potentially not having circumcision could actually lead to um, poor neg like poor health outcomes, like the transmission of HIV is reduced when men are circumcised. Um, and so I wanted to know if that's being discussed in consideration. Yes, that's being discussed and uh, being discussed. Um, what is said about that by, by, for instance, the Norwegian Children's Ombudsperson is that there is no evidence of this. Uh, rather to the contrary, that uh, research shows that it doesn't have a hygienic uh, um, cause anymore, any hygienic uh, justification any, anymore. It may have had before, but it doesn't have it anymore. I think that's what she says. For the transmission of HIV? Pardon? For the transmission? Yeah, no, she says it doesn't matter. Yeah. Uh, excuse me, there is a, but, but, uh, but of course it's a part of the discussion really because I know that in the US that is one of the main uh, reasons put forward for the circumcision of boys. Yeah, more than the cultural reasons, I think. Yeah. Then it's you, I think. Yes, thank or, or, you. Yeah. 
Um, I'm also a student at the Rollins School of Public Health. Um, my question has to do with the return of the countries in the, in the repeat dialogue after five, six, seven years, and if there's a different process that next time to address whether or not the observations were, um, were executed, and it sounds like there is not any penalty for not executing the, the recommendations, but I was wondering if there's any system for um, further encouraging those earlier concluding remarks in addition to new remarks in addition to any new observations that come from the new report, if you go back to what you know, was said the last time and address those again. Uh, I'm sorry to say that we don't have any, any um, sanctions or anything except uh, putting it even more strongly the next time that they have to do what we have asked them to do. Uh, so it's, it's really up to how, how eager is the government to, to fulfill these obligations and how active is civil society, how bad does the government look within the country uh, if it doesn't do what we say? Um, does it matter at all to the government? I mean, is it a d democracy where people will then not vote for this government next time? Or is it, and is this such a big issue that they will at all influence the voting result? So it's, um, it's really, uh, we need to trust um, government's own motivation and we try to, to make them motivated when they are in Geneva. And they often seem quite motivated when they are there, but then not always afterwards, it seems. But no, naming and shaming, uh, but we don't make lists, but other, other organizations actually make lists of, of who um, complies with the convention and to what extent and who does not. So um, it is possible to, to see it, uh, but we don't think that that is our uh, way to do things. But of course, if people look into the concluding observations, they will see that they haven't done what we sh said they should do. Mm. Barbara Stoll, I'm the Chair of Pediatrics in the School of Medicine here. Thanks for a lovely talk on an important topic. My plea to the committee in reviewing the data on circumcision is you commented on the need for a study. There's a huge body of international data. Recent review by the American Academy of Pediatrics just updated about a year ago that concluded that the uh, benefits outweigh the risks and mm -hmm. that there are clear health benefits. They include reduced risk of urinary tract infection in newborns, which can be life-threatening, and clear reduction in, in a number of sexually transmitted diseases, including, ST, including HIV. Mm -hmm. The data are clear. I'm not asking for opinion, but that people review carefully a number of meta-analyses, a number of uh, legitimate groups that have reviewed the data um, rather than the need for new studies. Yeah, I, I'm, I'll bring that back to particularly my own ombudsperson, I think. Uh, but what we said to Israel was for them to make a study, and that was not on the general uh, circumcision of boys, it was about those particular practices that were described to us. And they really, there was really some very bad consequences of some of those practices. And they were far reaching and much more, I mean, you couldn't justify those practices by the, the uh, hygienic, uh, reasons that have been mentioned here. And, and we wanted the state to do it themselves because they should look into it and not rely on what's been done elsewhere. But it was in, in a way to, to uh, ask for some activity on the part of the state. Mm -hmm. I, thank you so much, Professor, for coming and for this interesting uh, talk. I, my question is regarding uh, Muslim majority states. They usually, uh, when they rat ratified the CRC, they made this uh, general uh, reservation uh, that anything they are not bound by anything in violation of uh, Islamic law, and it's just a general reservation, and you cannot really tell what is Islamic law and what is the um, the reservation on. Uh, so my question is, what do you? do in this case, like when, when uh, a state or a Muslim majority state may make this reservation, mm -hmm. do you ask them to be specific about Islamic law or what, what violation uh, they are looking for? And um, in terms of, of uh, like the conflict between the religious law and the, uh, the provision of the CRC, um, how do you, you know, overcome this conflict and, mm -hmm. you know, if there is a strategy or plan for the, the committee to uh, work with on this? Thank you. 
Thank you. Yeah, it's an important question. We, um, we always ask the states to withdraw their reservations in, in this uh, instance of those countries that have this uh, Sharia law reservation. And since we have uh, uh, Muslim members of the committee, they can say this much more forcefully than I think other members. Um, and and uh, they can also point to uh, countries that do not have this reservation, even though they are Muslim. Um, uh, when it comes to, to um, what they, oh, you had, it, I, I was going to mention a point to something you said, but but we would, if there are, if there is a conflict between the Islamic law, yeah, uh, we would not ask them. I think, in particular, to to line up or to list the the um, provisions in Islamic law or Sharia law, which are uh, in opposition to the convention but we would when we write no when we read their report and when we uh, discuss issues with them we would then say that you don't do this because you say it is in in uh, contra it's contrary to islamic law um and and then we would discuss that with them and and uh, ask them to to change it um but i think some of our um members uh, from or Muslim members have actually said that there are not a lot of, of uh, provisions in the convention that are contrary to Islamic law. Um, one thing that we often ask of, sta ask of states is that they should have inheritance law that doesn't discriminate between girls and boys and that is a problem uh, for many states and then they say that no we need to follow Sharia law and we still ask them to, to change the rules. Okay, was that all you asked? Yeah, <laughs> good. Yeah. Last but not least, Dean. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for coming to enlighten us on a subject in which our country is not involved directly. Um, we do have children here. So um, actually, I'd like for you to address two things, if you don't mind. The committee's attention to the problem of trafficking of children, particularly sex trafficking as opposed to labor trafficking. And the second thing, does the committee um, pay any attention to the care of foster children, children that the state yeah. takes under its control? That, that one? Foster children, when the state takes custody of children that are not delinquent, they're just parents don't take care of them or they, for some reason. Those two, if you could address those, I'd appreciate it. Yes, uh, we, we certainly do pay a lot of attention to both of these uh, issues. Uh, this. Um, optional protocol on the sale of children, child prostitution and child pornography. Um, of course, sale of children is not exactly the same as trafficking, but at least it is very much the same. And also trafficking is mentioned in the convention. So we always raise this issue with the states where this is a problem. And I guess in most states it is actually a problem. And, and when the states uh, present their first report under this uh, optional protocol, we really discuss it a lot with them, what they do to uh, prevent trafficking from happening, and if they are a transit uh, country, what they can do about that, if they're a country of uh, origin or, or of uh, destination, we, we, we always discuss it thoroughly, that they should have the proper legislation, and then they should also um, do all kinds of preventive measures and, and have proper follow-up for the victims. So, yeah, I think we deal with that quite extensively, actually. Uh, as for foster children, that is also a, a great concern of the committee, uh, both that children are taken away from their families in, in cases where they should not, or not even taken away, but that also family place their children because of poverty, for instance, in institutions often, not even in, in foster families. Uh, and and deinstitutionalization is really uh, one of our really main issues of main, I mean, we have so many important issues, but it's a really important issue for the committee. Dealing with, for instance, East European countries that have had a massive institutionalization of children, this is something we always discuss with them. So it's both the issue of children being allowed to stay with their families in the first place, and if they have been placed in institutions, how to, and if they cannot stay with their families, then to have them in a family type environment and not in an institution. Um, and if possible, to, to make the conditions 
for the families, the original families, such that children can actually go back to those families. So we, we deal with this extensively under family environment and uh, children deprived of a family, the, those two. Hmm. On behalf of all of us, I'd certainly like to thank you very much for that fascinating and illuminating presentation and for all the work you do in support of international law and in support of the children of the world. So please join me in thanking you.